All right, all right. God bless each and every one of you in Christ Jesus. All right, so uh, of course, you know, my name is Brother Ron, and this is Brother Will. Yes, we are back again by the grace of God. We want to ultimately communicate the word of God, sound doctrine uh, towards the edifying of the body of Christ. It is vital that that people come into the reality of what God is saying to uh, the people of the earth. God is wanting uh, and and searching and empowering people to to transform into godly vessels that he ultimately will keep with him forever in eternity. And so God is uh, delighting that we come into the knowledge of who we are through him. And so God, ble God bless each and every one of you that are joining us today. And uh, tonight, actually, <laughs> tonight. And so uh, we're, we're going to be talking about some uh, some uh, powerful topics, uh, specifically um, the topic of law versus grace, uh, the topic of baptism, as well as the topic of hell. And and we're going to dive into these topics because they are topics that are of much debate, of much discussion and clarity must be reached in reference to them. Uh, God is doing a mighty work um, in the earth, despite the fact that humans don't see him. He is doing a work by his spirit. And so one of the scriptures that I wanted to touch on in reference to the first topic, law versus grace. All right. So what is law and what is grace? So when we're talking about law versus grace, we're talking about the law of God and the law of God, in, in a sense, has many forms over uh, the years. If you you if you've um, listened to me speak um, or listen to my brother speak, uh, sometimes we will say things like the the Old Testament is the New Testament revealed and the the New Test the, and the. Uh, and the Old Testament, uh, well, hold on, how, how do I say it again? <laughs> the, the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, the, and, and the, uh, the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. And so there is a revelation. Uh, there's an unfolding. There's an unwrapping in reference to what the New Testament reveals and uh, concerning the the righteousness of God, concerning the truth of God. And the Old Testament is a veiled version. It is a uh, wrapped version. It is uh, not a completely expounded on version that that God ultimately has done in his righteousness it, because of his own prerogative because of his own uh, desire and design he has caused the 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 old testament to not reveal the fullness of what he uh, ultimately desires why because one of the um, man, one of the reasons is because of the the slow reveal of the Messiah. The Messiah, uh, w it, it was necessary that the Messiah be revealed over a period of time for specific reasons. And so we can touch on a lot of those things, but that's not what this video is about. This video is about law and, and, and grace as well as baptism and hell. So when we're talking about law and grace, uh, one of the um, issues that we have in this modern day is a debating with uh, specifically uh, with those that want to keep the law in this New Testament era, in this New Testament time or dispensation. There is an attempt to keep the law, which is what we know, according to the scripture, is the old covenant. And so 
this. So when we're talking about keeping the law, we're talking about individuals that want to keep the 613 laws that are of the Mosaic law, this Mosaic law that came through Moses. And so these um, Levitical laws, these um, uh, sacrificial laws, these dietary laws, these um, laws of how to uh, um, reason between each other, how uh, I, these laws of justice, in a sense, um, all of these laws were the righteousness of God in its day, the, the veiled version of the righteousness of God in its day. But there has been a transition uh, by way of Jesus. Jesus has brought forth something new, something whole, something complete. And so there's a scripture that I wanted to bring up in Matthew 5, which is a scripture of great debate among those that believe that they should keep the law, that they should abide in the, 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 the law, right? And so in verse 17 of, of, ch of Matthew chapter 5, it says, think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. These are the words of Jesus. And verse, verse 18 says, for verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. And so what is Jesus, what is Jesus saying? What is Jesus talking about? One of the things that Jesus is telling us is that he is affirming what God had established as far as the beginning of this Mosaic law of what started through Moses. He is not saying that it was nonsense or that it was irrelevant or that people who keep it are just blind. He, he's not saying that. He's affirming that there is a value to it. There, there is a righteousness to it in the sense that in its day, it was something that God wanted man to keep. But there was, there's, there's frailty in us to keep the law. There's something that we could, we, we could not fulfill it. We could not live this law out, uh, in its fullest entirety towards the fulfillment that Jesus did, right? And so we have Jesus saying, um, there is a time limit. He's giving a time limit. He's saying something about the fact that there is, uh, nothing is going to change what, uh, the law is supposed to, uh, stand for until the fulfilling of it comes. And that's who Jesus is. Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. He is the fulfillment of the law, the fulfillment of the requirements. And so what requirements we have, what, what I just talked about, which was the, 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 the aspects of sacrifice, sac the, the sacrificial uh, requirements that were in the law. And so we have Jesus who is the one who brings forth that fulfillment and you know year by year mm -hmm. they would have to sacrifice they would have to you know bring forth all forms of of uh, of giving of whatever it was to the the temple to these levites to these priests that would ultimately atone temporarily for the sins of the children of israel but we have a uh, remembering of those sins again. We, as it says in uh, Hebrews chapter 10, we have a continuing of the, 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 the sins. Um, we don't have a purifying completely. We don't have an, et an, an eternal purification of these sins. We have uh, a, a remaining a, a of these sins through, through this uh, temporary uh, atonement. And so Jesus, on the other hand, is the one who fulfills the requirements of the law. He fulfills it through his 
the, his perfect living. He, he lives perfect before them. He sinned not one time. He, he was sinless before them. And not only that, uh, as a sinless representative, as a sinless lamb, right? Uh, John the Baptist says, behold, the lamb of God who taketh away the sins of the world, right? And so as this sinless representative, he, he, uh, his body fulfills it through this sacrifice. He, his blood is the atoning factor uh, that cleanses us from our sins for the remission of our sins. And so there is a powerful uh, uh, example that's being shown through Jesus doing what he did. Uh, there, there's this is what this is the sacrifice. The Bible says that um, that uh, that that in the that in the blood uh, that light there is life in the blood. He says in in the blood there is life, and so the life, the power, the grace that was in Jesus's blood, because we know his blood is not just any man's blood. We're talking about God mm -hmm. in human form. So the, he fulfills the requirements of this law, this pre-existing law. Uh, he is the transition between the old law into the new law. He fulfilled, he, he completed, he, he uh, satisfied the requirements of the mosaic law and then he doesn't renew the law he gives us a new law he doesn't like revive the the old testament law he gives us a new testament not an old testament he gives us a new testament and that is the new testament by which men are considered righteous and are judged by that new testament uh, of grace. All right. So, uh, brother will go ahead and, um, touch on this topic in reference to law and grace in reference to Matthew five, um, uh, verses 17, 18 and 19. Yeah. The, and apo the apostle Paul in, in, I don't remember which verse or, or book it was in, but he said that the man, it may have been Galatians, but the man, he says the man who, who is going to do the law is going to live by the law. But then he mentions how that, that, Nobody's justified um, by the works of the law and how those who do not continue in all things that are in the law are cursed by God. Right. So because Jesus becoming a curse for us so that he would deliver us from from the law that condemns us, he, he blots out the writing. Um, he says it contained in ordinances right. that was held against us. So and then you mentioned um, you mentioned Hebrews 10, how it talks about that it's not possible for the blood of of goats and of calves to take away sins. Mm -hmm. So with Jesus Christ, since he comes to deal with sin, we may walk in newness of life. So instead right. of having to, to go after the law, instead of having to try to um, live under our standard that we can't keep, Jesus kept it for us. And it says um, even later in uh, Matthew uh, chapter 5, it, he says specifically, um, in, what was it, verse 20, he says, except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. So the Pharisees were individuals who they they were leaders. They were they were they were leaders. They were religious leaders who 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 knew the Old Testament scriptures. Jesus mm -hmm. acknowledged the fact that these guys tithed. Right. They 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 tithed. They they taught the people. Right. They went. They were willing to go to different nations to make disciples. But he said that you guys lack the mercy, the love, and the knowledge of God. So what the real issue is, um, and it's not like in the New Testament. Yes, we have a New Testament covenant. Jesus does give us New Testament commandments. And it doesn't mean that because we're under grace that we can, we can sin and still be covered to sin. Because hmm. God will just cover us and, and we won't be held accountable for our sin. That's not real grace. Hmm. Grace gives us the ability to, 
grace rather gives us the, the, the power to obey God. Right. And, and not to cover us while we continue in sin. So what separates the new covenant from the old covenant, other than the fact that Jesus Christ has come, has fulfilled the Old Testament and we can walk in newness life. We, we have his nature now mm -hmm. before the spirit of God did not fill um, the believers back then. So right. they had to be governed by a law to ensure that that they would be protected. If right. they stepped outside of that law mm -hmm. and how that happened was through false God worship and, and mm -hmm. God was trying to protect them from that. Now that we have Jesus Christ, um, because he he fulfilled the law, when we obey Jesus, we are fulfilling the law with the law of God because it is spiritual. So ultimately, if we receive Jesus Christ, we receive his nature, we receive his spirit, mm -hmm. and he considers mm -hmm. us perfect. So when we're led by the spirit of God, right. we will not sin. Right. Um, so essentially put, the reason why people want to follow the law, or, or you mentioned the, the 613 laws. Well, some may say, well, we're not talking about all that. <laughs> we're just only talking about the Ten Commandments. Well, the problem that you run into that is, um, well, even the fourth commandment, you know, the Sabbath day, um, the Lord, as you mentioned, Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. So if I want to go and keep the law and I want to keep the Sabbath, but yet Jesus wants me to go over here, he wants me to, go to he wants me to go to, to this area, or he wants me to do that. But I want to hold to the law and say, well, no, I can't do those things because this is a day of rest mm -hmm. and I'm going to run into trouble. He told Hosea the prophet to marry a woman who was a harlot, which was a contrary to the law. Right. So essentially what we're saying is Jesus Christ supersedes the law. Now, it doesn't mean we're as as New Testament believers, it doesn't mean we're without law. We have the law of Christ. There are standards that right. he has set for his church, but they are not burdensome as the Old Testament law. Um, the, the, what we're talking about is faith in God. What is God telling us to do? Um, you know, love our neighbor as ourself, love him with all of our hearts. He, he takes it a step further, but he gives us power to obey him. And so what we're essentially is talking about is faith. Mm -hmm. Jesus is going to ask us to do things. He's going to empower us to do things in which we would not have been able to do concerning the law. And there are things that Jesus has us to do now as New Testament believers, where in the Old Testament it was forbidden, like mm -hmm. the eating of unclean foods. Right, right. Um, we were, right. you know, now he's he, in, in 1 Timothy 4 and even in Acts chapter 10, when he gave Peter that dream and that vision, he said specifically, what well, God has now cleansed, don't call common, don't right. call unclean. So right. we have examples of how now that Jesus Christ has given us the new covenant, um, it's by faith now. So faith, uh, as Paul puts it in Galatians, law is not a faith. They they cannot right. uh, work together because right. the law is a standard that was set by God for this dispensation. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the law, that there's no faith because now you, you you have a standard already. But but with the Lord in the New Testament covenant, as we seek to obey God, um, there are going to be Mm -hmm. things that he's going to reveal to us by his spirit, which otherwise the law would not have done. So, Absolutely. and also essentially put the gifts of the spirit of God. Right. The apostle Paul made it very clear that, that those who seek to be justified by the law are fallen from grace. So they are not going mm -hmm. to anyone who wants to be justified by the law of Moses mm -hmm. or the, and the 10 commandments. Mm -hmm. You are not going to be led by the spirit of God and you are not going to be able to operate in the power of God because you are cutting yourself off from the spirit of God because you're, you're going to count it as an unholy thing right. as, as I believe Hebrews chapter 10 or 6 speaks on. Amen. Amen. And so that's what we're talking about. I, I pulled up a scripture here that um, I just ran right into it, which was um, in 1 Corinthians chapter. Uh, actually, let's see here. Let me pull it up here. Yeah, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6, it says, Who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. Amen. And so that is paramount right there. That's paramount because it's telling us that the, the Spirit of God uh, by faith, we, we have through faith, we receive the counsel of the Lord. We receive the, the, the power of the Lord. There's a, the scripture um, in, uh, in um, John, 
uh, it tells us, uh, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, not of them that believe. Uh, not those that were born of the, the flesh or the will of man or, or any other thing, but those that were born of the spirit. And so we have here in Second Corinthians is telling us that not of the letter, the letter killeth like at the the when the letter uh, when we sin requires death, when we uh in according to the old covenant when a transgression happens the the requirement for that is death the requirement from that is is a a a payment at that point for the transgression but we have this grace which is superior to that superior to it's it's so we have the the perfection of what Jesus did uh, through the cross, through his, uh, uh, through his endless knowledge, through his, his, the, what the word of God, um, talks about in reference to, uh, uh, I, I was going to talk about uh, perfection, but I don't want to go too far because there was, um, the verse 19 and 20 that I wanted to ask you about, because in reference to Matthew five, because we want to talk about that as well. Uh, but, but as I was saying in reference to this verse here, we are ministers of the new Testament. And, and I wanted to stress that this is not a, a remaking of the old covenant. This is, this is a fulfillment, a satisfying of what the old covenant required that Jesus fulfilled. And so the New Testament that we have now is not of the letter, not of old. It is a, tr it's, it's the, the, the new Testament, the new administering of God's righteousness to the people of the earth. And so um, going back to Matthew uh, five, I wanted you kind of expound on that real quick in reference to. Um, let me see, verse uh, eighteen. Verse no, actually, I stopped at eighteen. Verses nineteen and twenty, uh, because as we were mentioning here, Jesus is uh, affirming the law to a degree because he's still alive at this point. He's still alive at this point. He is. Uh, 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 he is under the law. He was raised under the law, the Mosaic law. He was he participated in acts. He participated in certain um, things that, of course, um, the Jewish nation was all about the, the, the schooling um, or whatnot or, or whatever it was in reference to him being taught the 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 law him being in, instructed in the ways of god or instructed in what righteousness was and and so he uh but that so he's not saying um and so those people may say that we're we're uh completely erasing the old law as if it was uh without value but that's not what we're saying. We're saying that there was a purpose and Jesus fulfilled the purpose of the law. And now we graduate to a new dispensation according to God's predestined understanding and knowledge and prerogative. And then and now we are as Second uh, Corinthians chapter three, verse six says we are ministers of the New Testament. So go ahead and um, talk about verses 18. Oh, verses 19 and 20 as well. Okay, verses 19 and 20, it, it mentions after you talk about how no no, no um, jot, title, no wise pass from law to all be fulfilled, which he did fulfill. Right. Verse 19 says, Whosoever therefore will break one of the least commandments and shall teach men, so mm -hmm. he will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. In verse 20, for I say to you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. And before I go ahead and comment out that when he when he told his disciples that unless you be converted mm -hmm. and become like little children, you will not be able to enter into the kingdom. Why? Because little children are not just innocent, mm -hmm. but they're willing to learn. Right. They're, they're quick to forgive. Right. And, and, and the thing is with this passage, um, Jesus is letting us know that he is actually honoring the law. Mm -hmm. Isaiah talks about how he's going to make it, he's going to make it honorable. Right. So not just obviously the law, the Moses, 
but essentially put the law of God in, in, in principle, in totality, in totality. Yeah. So yeah. here, before his, before his, and now he's letting his followers know, or those who are hearing this, not just his disciples, but those who would hear this, that I've come to make it honorable. So, and this is before his crucifixion. Like, okay, well, you know, continue. And, and he, and he even makes that statement when he talked about the. Uh, those who sin in Moses, see, I believe in Matthew 23, where he tells them, whatsoever they tell you or bid you, you do, but don't do after their works. Right. So obviously he made the law honorable. But then in verse 20, he's saying, but except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness, the righteousness of the scribes right. and Pharisees, you will in no wise enter in the kingdom, which he's establishing the fact, well, yes, I, God has set an order. He has set a law to follow. Right. But what is he really looking for? He's looking for your heart to our hearts to love him, essentially. Amen. Amen. And it goes back to what I was saying before, how the Pharisees, they knew the scriptures. They taught the people that had a reputation for 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 being able to speak on the things of God. They they did tithe, you know, they tithed right, right. not just, you know, their their money, but their the the, 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 the crops. Their ca cattle, crops, the crops, all that. And they were willing to go to other people, groups, nations to make disciples, but but their hearts were were far from God essentially. And that's essentially what we're talking about even mm -hmm. in today's day. Those who want to, you know, say I believe in Jesus and follow the Lord but while keeping the but emphasizing the law of Moses or the mm -hmm. Ten Commandments it's it's pride because mm -hmm. yes you want to keep the law and the commandments you want to study them you want to you want to let people know that you're on that mm -hmm. but essentially put that those who want to be justified by the law and have not completely submitted to his spirit mm -hmm. um there's a lacking of heart transformation there's right. obvious worldliness there's obvious um error in that mm -hmm. because though you may uh, though you may have encountered god or um, the word of God drew your interest. There is a a refusal on the part of any individual who is mm -hmm. being justified by the law. They're not truly submitted to Jesus. They have not given up that aspect of their hearts or that desire to to want to glory in the flesh. Mm -hmm. Though they may not realize it, you are glorying in your flesh, and and God wants total submission. What what can happen is if we want to follow the law and the commandments and say that we have to keep them what we are saying is that jesus sacrifice was not enough right and, and we feel like we have to do something right like i owe god i have to work for salvation and that's mm -hmm. essentially what we're saying i have to work for it because i will not be satisfied with just believing per se because what because i'm just a bad you know i'm just a bad person so i feel like i have to owe god i have to to, to work back this debt that i owe god and the things that I've done, but I, I can't do that. And that's essentially what happens. Like, oh, I have to keep the Sabbath day. I have to keep the ceremonial laws. I have to keep this or that. Not realizing that what ends up happening is it's, it ends up being more of an outward appearance, but the heart on the inside is still desperately wicked. That's why the Lord can say, you know, well, I said to you in old time, you know, thou shalt not commit adultery. And if you didn't commit the physical act, then you would have been okay. But it still could have been very much in your heart. Right. Whereas now Jesus, in, in actually the next, the next verse talks about it, where like, where he, he gets into that, he says, but it, but, but if you look on a woman to lust after in your heart, you've already committed adultery. Mm -hmm. So he takes it a step further. Now he comes to deal with the heart. Mm -hmm. So it's not that he never dealt with the heart, mm -hmm. but now, but now because he gives us the spirit and mm -hmm. now he's, giving us more access to himself. Now he's like wanting to deal with the internal desires. And that's essentially what it, if we follow the law, mm -hmm. we can do, we can deal with our heart mm -hmm. because we already have a standard. We're going to look at the law instead of looking at Jesus. And that's essentially what he's trying to get across. He, he comes to deal with the heart. He comes to save us from our own desires and from our own perspectives. And right. essentially what we're really saying is, is that what is God really saying? Right. What is God specifically saying? And he is not, he is not wanting us to be under the burdens of the Old Testament covenant because the Old Testament covenant made nobody perfect mm -hmm. and nobody kept them. Right. Jesus kept it. And now he's saying, follow me and I'll give you life. Right. Amen. Amen. And so we I, I want to transition um, not to the next topic yet, because this is a powerful topic that we have to really uh, 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 allow the Lord uh, to exhaust in us, because I'm, I'm feeling that we should definitely um, look at um Let's see here. Uh, Romans, Romans chapter three. We, we have to expound on Romans chapter three because there is a need for us to know what God has done through faith 
in us, you know, uh, through our faith, as we, um, as we believe on him, we know the word of God says we've, we quote it so much, um, uh, but I'm going to quote it again. Uh, we are saved by grace through faith, not of um, not of ourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Um, and then it goes on to say, you know, um, for uh, for we, uh, for um, for for we are basically by his. Uh, how does it go again? And for, let me actually go to it. Uh, very um, powerful verse in Ephesians chapter two. Oh, uh, just the spirit of God brought it back to me for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works that God has ordained before that we should walk in them. And so, the, the, so there, there is by God's awesome grace, there is a, um, strengthening, um, of us, of our bodies, through faith in him, through faith in what Jesus did for us. So our righteousness is Jesus first. It's not us. We do uh, operate in acts of righteousness. We do operate in acts of holiness, but our righteousness is Jesus first. It's, it's all about Jesus. Our holiness is all about Jesus, but there is uh, specific works of holiness uh, that God wants us to keep ourselves in. There's certain acts of righteousness that God wants us to execute. And so those are definitely important, but we cannot forget that it is by grace through the faith that God has infused in us that we are saved. Um, and so uh, let's go to, uh, uh, let's see here, let's see here. Romans 3. I'm going to go down to about verse 19. Uh, Romans 3 verse 19. It tells us, now we know uh, that what thing soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, uh, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, shall no flesh be justified in his sight for by the law is the knowledge of sin. That's what my brother was talking about earlier. Um, verse 21, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested being witnessed by the law and the prophets. That is an amazing concept for righteousness to exist or to manifest in without the law. Without the law, how is there righteousness when the law was the righteousness of God? We are talking about what Jesus did in reference to the fact that he transitions this righteousness, this knowledge of God's righteousness from the law to the New Testament covenant that he has inducted all of us into those of us who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and understand that we must be led by his spirit so that we can uh, truly uh, be the redeemed of God. And so I'm going to keep reading because um, that, that's about powerful statement. We, you could probably comment on that a little later as well. Um, it, verse 22, it says, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith, uh, by, by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe for there is no difference for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus whom God hath set forth to be the propitiation very powerful word propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Um, should I keep going? This is this is very powerful. Um, Maybe verse 28. Yeah, verse 28. Um, I'm going to keep going uh, to declare. I say at this time, his righteousness that he might be uh, might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Where is boasting then? 
it is excluded by what law of works nay or no but by the law of faith mm -hmm. the law of faith is what excludes the mosaic law and so therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law mm -hmm. very powerful so what are we saying here we're saying that through the the induction of faith in us as we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ there is a a faith in us being born and in that in that faith as God gives us um, that faith because we know that no man comes to God it's it, it, the Bible talks about God draws all men yeah. by his spirit so there is a drawing of of sons and daughters of God that God does and there is an introduction of these individuals into faith and as their faith grows as obedience manifests in their lives there is a strengthening of them and the knowledge of God and the grace on their lives to become who God has ordained them to become and so there's a powerful um, aspect here I, I wanted to bring out um, how it, um, it it talks about the boasting of the law. Why you, you you said earlier in reference to there is a glorying in the flesh. You know the Bible tells us that um, that there there no man will glory. You know in reference to um, no flesh shall glory in his presence. You know th there is a a glorying that man cannot obtain uh, because God shares his glory with no other and so we have a boasting that the law can allow because there is a there can be a comparing there can be a looking at someone else and saying hey I keep the law better than they all I, I do this I do. so there's a boasting so there's a a so so faith is something that comes or the grace in faith comes from God and so it eliminates boasting because even when we do specific acts or works it is by the very grace and power of God that we do them and so this is why Paul can say that I labored more excellently than they all but then he quickly corrects himself and says, you know, yet not I, but the grace of God that was in me to accomplish these things. And so it is the strength of God. It is the, the, the forbearance of God. It is the, the love of God that strengthens us to really accomplish what we accomplish in the spirit. And so the law is, as you were saying, uh, a a idol to most it, it becomes an idol they uh, we, we, we know in in um, it, even with in the stories um, when we read Gideon we know that they uh, made the ephod a a idol they idolized the ephod and and mm -hmm. so there are so many things that w the children of Israel uh, did to pervert something that was originated for good uh, you know, uh, so God is trying to aid us into uh, not uh, remaining in that uh, that that corrupted state, but ascending beyond a the, the the points of confusion, the points of of corruption, into a place to where we can really receive in humility the revelation and the power of God so that we can be the true sons and daughters of God. And so any, any comments in reference to, there was so much said here, I couldn't um, unfold it all and pack it all, but I, by the grace of God, if you wanted to comment on anything here, you definitely can. Um, yeah, just a quick comment. Um, and I'll just go ahead with um, the last verse you read, actually. Uh, Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Um, simply put, Paul, obviously, you made a reference of how he was um, explaining, and I think he did it in Corinthians too, 
And there was another uh, book he did it in where he was explaining how he was a Pharisee of Pharisees. Mm-hmm. You know, according to the law, he was more exceeding, exceedingly zealous than his fathers. Right. And how he basically persecuted Christians before. Right. So as far as in his in his mind, he was doing it better than they were. Right. You know, but then he, he, he talks about in Philippians how, but he counted all that for loss for the sake of knowing Jesus Christ as Lord. So Paul would have understood um, what the works of the law were because he was doing that. Right. And how it did not profit him. Instead, he had a zeal that was not according to knowledge. Right. So that's essentially what we're talking about. Having the knowledge of God. What is God requiring for us now in this present day than what he required back then? And because... God, um, an example of this, I guess the last example of this was when in John chapter 9, when Jesus heals the blind man, um, the blind man testifies to the fact that Jesus had healed him. And then he was like, do you also want to be his disciples? Mm. And what was their response to him? He said, you know, you're his disciple. We are Moses disciples. Right. So what they were really saying is we keep the law. He doesn't. Mm-hmm. So what's going on here is that there's a lack of faith. There's a lack of the awareness of what God is doing. And that's essentially what we are saying here. Right, right. There's a lacking of the awareness of, of what God is doing now than what he did then. And that's what's going to cause people to gravitate, to want to keep the law of Moses, to be justified before God. Because they are lacking the fact that God is 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 available to them in a closer and more intimate way, which back then they would have not had access to and and again the awareness of the fact that god can transform the heart by his spirit Mm -hmm. and his righteousness has been revealed whereas in the old testament as brother ron was saying um was given to man through the works of the law now it's faith in god without the deeds of the law right and that's essentially where most people are tripping up right right and so um just a closing thought um, we know the children of Israel in the wilderness, uh, they, God chose at that point to begin to give them the law. And uh, it was essential that a group of people, uh, maybe uh, hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions of individuals uh, that came out of Egypt at that time, we're talking about a people who were in bondage to heavy slavery. And so we know that slavery is something that breaks down the mind. It breaks down hope. It breaks down uh, the, the essential elements of the nature of a human being. And we know that it was essential that God give them the law because giving them grace at that moment would not have been good it would have been abused and so god in his infinite wisdom gives the children of israel the law in that in that time for them to keep the law and for them to understand the strictness at that point of the law and so it it was something that would ultimately end as jesus brought it to its fulfillment but the law was necessary. And so some some of us may, uh, especially those who are in the different camps that, um, and I'm not going to really say any names because it's not um, the point, but the, the different camps that decide to keep the law, whether they be uh, camps that are identifiable or they be Christian individuals that want to both keep some of the deeds of the law and operate in grace uh, whether uh, whatever camp you're in th- there must be a knowledge that that there is no dueling that there can be no dueling of of the law of Moses and grace it, it's either one or the other or <clears throat> the individual ultimately is disqualified as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ by faith um, and, and so we know that faith is the justifier. And just one more, one more comment. Um, when I think of First Timothy chapter one, um, it, and it just came back to mind um, when the apostle Paul talks about the law. He says the law is not made for a righteous person, right. but for the lawless and disobedient. Right. And he talks about um, those who are who who 
are whoremongers, kidnappers, uh, perjured mm. persons, and any and, and then a few other things. And he says anything that is contrary to sound doctrine. But right. really, what we're really saying is, is that a righteous person, one who is in right standing with God, one who has a heart after God, you don't have to tell him not to do certain things. Right. But those who are not going to obey God, there is in there is a either uh, a not wanting to follow God, or mm -hmm. if you do want to follow God, you're going to run to the to the law mm -hmm. because the law is like what your safety net. Right. But yet on the inside, the fact that you desire mm -hmm. to keep something that has been put away just shows that you are considered lawless before God. You're considered unclean before God, and the mm -hmm. law is there to keep you from doing um, greater harm, so to speak. Um, but those who are in right standing with God are not desiring to have the law of Moses um, to m ensure that they don't do wrong because it's not in them to do wrong. And that goes back to the nature mm -hmm. of God being imparted to us, Christ in you, the hope mm -hmm. of glory. So yes. now that we've received the Spirit of God and we're led by the Spirit of God, it's not in us to commit sin and that's why john can say he who is born of god does not commit sin mm -hmm. it doesn't mean that we don't ever commit a sin it mm -hmm. just means that when we are born of god and are doing the will of god for our lives we keep short accounts with it it doesn't rule over us it doesn't reign over us mm -hmm. we deal with it and we and we seek the lord for forgiveness and he and he washes us we're perfect in him whereas without the spirit of god without um god reigning over us and, and being led by the spirit of god then we don't have control or or power over our sinful desires. Right, right. And so um, <laughs> let's not continue this topic any any longer. Uh, we, we can definitely uh, do this entire video on this topic alone. But um, but by the grace of God, we have to transition to baptism. Let's talk about baptism because th this is another topic that <clears throat> in this modern world there is a rejection of baptism in the sense that um, there is a lowering of the, the value of baptism as if it's something that we can take it or leave it. It's something that, you know, we, um, you know, it's on the back burner. It's something that, you know, it's not necessarily uh, essential to the faith when it actually is essential it's something that Jesus himself participated in and it is something that he commanded his disciples all those that would follow him to literally do and so in John chapter 3 uh, as Jesus is talking to Nicodemus he, he says something very powerful um, in verse 3 he says um, uh, Jesus said on Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man uh, be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man or woman for that matter be born of the water the water of baptism and of the spirit, the encounter of the spirit of God, he or she cannot enter, mm -hmm. cannot walk in, cannot have access to life eternal, cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And so there is a uh, emphasis here of the water this baptism this and what is baptism baptism is the submerging of one into a body of water why because it is symbolizing the very death burial and resurrection of the lord jesus christ so as a person is dipped into the water it is representing the death representing death and burial burial into that water just like jesus was buried um, in a tomb and when we rise up out of the water we are uh, symbolizing the very rising of jesus out of the tomb um and um ultimately um 
seated at the right hand of his father. You know, we're, 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 we're describing his victory. The Bible talks about in 1 Corinthians 15, you know, um, oh, 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 death, where is your, st- uh, uh, oh, 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 death, where is your sting? Oh, grave, where is your victory? Or, or maybe vice versa. I haven't quote, quoted in a long time. But, um, you know, it, it, and that is specifically talking about, you know, that, that victory that Jesus has, you know, defeating death, the very thing that kept men and women in bondage forever, as far as for all of human existence. There is a fear of death, a fear of the unknown, a fear of, of, of the, the, the place of no return, per se. This fear of this, this um, experiencing this transition, this, this uh, the, you know, when people who witness death, they witness the body who was, who, uh, which was alive, which was full of life, which was um, vibrant, not able to function any longer. And it's completely separated. That image people are terrified of. You know, as I was saying earlier, uh, the life of the body is in the blood. And Jesus and his, his blood cleanses our sin, renews us, give us, gives us a new reputation. And we know that death is simply a transition for us, a transition to righteousness, a, a transition to uh, the, the very, um, you know, the Bible says that absent from the body is present with the Lord. We know as soon as we die, there is a uh, uh, a, a standing before the Lord Jesus. There is an entering into the kingdom of heaven. There is access for those that are believers in the Lord Christ Jesus. So when we're talking about baptism, what we're talking about the necessity of understanding the, the significance of what it's talking about. It's talking about the, the, the very uh, center of our walk, the very center of what we believe in. So for us not to participate in something so monumental, for us to put on the back burner something so monumental, we're talking about the death, burial, and resurrection. We're not talking about, you know, giving to your brother. We're not talking about um, giving your brother a coat if you have two coats. We're not talking about those are can be um, in a sense peripheral in a, in a sense, you know, like giving to your brother or or, you know, other things. You know, we're not talking about walking the old lady across the street. We're not talking about, um, you know, certain other peripheral elements of the faith. We're talking about something that represents the very center of the faith and the baptism is is commanded of the sons of god to do we can turn to um uh let's see we can turn to let's see what acts uh let's see what is it well you turn there i'll go ahead and um yeah go ahead brother i mentioned also in john chapter one when it talks about how when um the Lord by his spirit told John, um, because John had told us that the reason why he was baptized in the beginning was because the spirit bade, bade him to do it. The spirit of God told John to go Amen. into the wilderness and to baptize the people um, and, until Messiah is you know, to be revealed. And by that, um, John would know who he was. Right. So when Jesus goes there, John says, Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. So he recognized who he was because the Spirit of God at that moment let him know who he was. Right. And then I think it was in, in Matthew or in Luke, it, it, it writes it as in when Jesus approached him, John um, says specifically, you know, I should be baptized of you. Right. Why do right. you come to me? And then this is, me? and this goes back to, and, and mind you, this is what Jesus says right after that. He says, no, suffer it thus so. So it, it, it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness, right. but yet he's saying to be f- to fulfill all righteousness, but yet baptism is not of the law of Moses. Mm-hmm. So what was Jesus talking about? So, but very interesting enough, he says that because, and then when Jesus is baptized, John specifically saw that when he 
came up out of the water, the Spirit of God descended on him like a dove, and it lighted upon him. Then there came a voice from heaven and said, This is my beloved Son with whom I'm well pleased. So we're, we're understanding many things here. As Brother Ron mentioned, that no one can enter or see the kingdom of God unless they're born again of the water and of the Spirit. Now, let's use a little wisdom here. Yes, a person can receive the Spirit of God before they are baptized in water. Um, and, it, and it can also happen the other way too. A person can receive Jesus Christ, be baptized, and then receive the, the Spirit of God. That's why we have those examples in the book of Acts to show us that the Lord in His sovereignty can do it a few different ways. But essentially, mm -hmm. the person who's truly been converted is going to do exactly what Jesus said. Right. And that's why in this passage, um, Jesus is giving us an example in which He is baptized giving us an example of how what we should do if we are to submit our lives to him uh -huh. and then as he comes out the spirit of god comes upon him right and then the father says this is my beloved son so when we well receive jesus christ as lord he gives us the power to become the sons of god and that is through baptism of the water and of the spirit which shows that we have truly committed we've mm -hmm. been truly converted right. and then Later in John chapter 3, as Brother Ron quoted the whole situation with Nicodemus, after that, John's disciples came to John himself and asked him right. about purifying. And then they acknowledged the fact that Jesus and his disciples were baptizing. Mm -hmm. And many and, and they were and most people were starting to be baptized by them. Right. So baptism essentially is essential for salvation because Jesus, as Brother Ron mentioned in John 3, that we cannot obtain salvation without being baptized of the water and the spirit and and that's just the standard that he has set for the church in order for us to come into new covenant relationship with jesus we have to be in agreement with that right amen amen uh, one of the scriptures that i wanted to point out was in mark 16. i'm going to read um just a few verses um in verse um 15 it says and he said unto them go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils. They shall speak in new tongues. They shall take up uh, speak in new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. And uh, hurt them. Uh, they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover and so what is it saying it's it's talking uh, uh, let's narrow in uh let's zero in on where it, where it talks about baptism there and it says that he that believes and is baptized so my belief on the lord jesus christ my faith that is born on born concerning the lord jesus christ should bring a type of unction, an unction that tells me that there is a, a, a need for me to be uh, in a, a, uh, a position of closeness and connection with uh, the Savior. So, what what am I saying? I'm saying that there is, whenever we're talking about um, th the consummation of marriage, whenever we're talking about the the things that are the solidifying points uh, about a specific connection, whenever we're talking about the need to solidify something where we're talking about uh, specific acts that we do that bring about that revelation or that representation so when we're talking about baptism it it connects it doesn't separate it says he that believeth and is baptized in the sense that there is an act there is an unction that that pushes the believer to have the thought and the the desire to be baptized so a person who believes on the lord jesus christ and is given the knowledge that baptism is something that they ought to do they immediately want to be a part of that and do that why because 
there is that need to connect with the Lord Jesus Christ. And they do that uh, and, and we see the power behind uh, entering into that covenant in that way. It's not a coincidence that there is the death, burial, and resurrection behind that, and Jesus requires that we enter into that. There is the need for us to know that God delights in us entering into that gateway, that entering into that form of connection, that, that, that supernatural um, element um, of our faith, which brings about a, a some level of an identifier. Now, we're not saying that everybody who who's, who who professes and believes per se uh, and, and is baptized is automatically um, going to inherit eternal life per se. We're not, we're not saying that you, people can be baptized and it can be considered you just getting wet because there is no uh, fruit meat. For repentance, mm -hmm. there's no repentance behind it. You know that this is what John the Baptist said. You know, um, bring forth fruit that is adequate to describe that repentance is a factor in uh, your faith, in reference to your life, in reference to your lifestyle. You know, this is why. You know, people of all walks, you know, whether they be homosexual, whether they be um, whoremongers, whether they be whatever they are, there is a necessity to realize the the deadness of the old life, the deadness of the works of the flesh, the old, the dead works and the being made alive through Christ, through the blood that washes away the sins of mankind. And so that is essential. Uh, and, and so baptism is not something light. It's something very essential that is, uh, that is something that the Spirit of God brings forth through an unction for mankind to participate and do, which connects them with the covenant. Brother Will? And um, just to use a few examples in the book of Acts, um, obviously with Peter, um, after the day of Pentecost when... Um, they all spoke with tongues and then they all wondered at this. Why are they hearing everyone speak in their own language? Right. Um, G then he starts to rehearse the fact of, of how Jesus was the Messiah and how he was put to death because of their unbelief. And then the people were cut to the heart um, and, and, and they repented saying, you know, what must we do to, you know, he says, right. repent and believe, repent and be baptized, everyone. Yeah. And they were the baptized. Jesus, yeah. And then in the book of in, in Acts chapter 10 with Cornelius and his servants, um, as Peter um, comes down to meet these guys, he starts to preach the word of God. And before he even finishes preaching the word of God, the spirit of God comes upon him. So now they're baptized with the spirit of God before mm -hmm. they are um, mm -hmm. immersed in, the water. in water. Right. But then what does Peter say right after that? He says, now, you know, how, how can we forbid water, mm -hmm. basically? So mm -hmm. they got water baptized. Mm -hmm. The Spirit of God fell upon them. Mm -hmm. So that just happened before water baptism. Mm -hmm. So the point that we're trying to make is that God is going to work as he works. He's going to work according to his own will. But essentially, the true believer is essentially going to have done both, received the Spirit of God and have been water baptized. Exactly what Jesus said would happen to the believer, to those who believe. And, and one more example of that is the Apostle Paul himself. Mm -hmm. um, Paul, when he meets Jesus, Jesus appears to him on his way to Damascus. Mm -hmm. and, and he talks about how he sends, he, he sends him to, you know, to continue to go to Damascus. Mm -hmm. and, and a man named Ananias is going to lay hands on him. And it says specifically in Acts chapter 9, he, Ananias lays his hands on him and he receives his sight. Then later on in the book of Acts, I believe chapter 23 or 24, that Paul is rehearsing what happened to him when he's mm -hmm. speaking to the Jews who want to take his life, essentially. Mm -hmm. And he's letting them know that he went there. He received his sight by the laying on of hands. He, it says specifically that he had received the Spirit of God in mm -hmm. that transaction. And then Ananias tells Paul, why do you tarry? What, don't, don't, don't waste any more time. Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. 
So essentially baptism of the water and the spirit is essential to one salvation because we have examples of this in the gospels and in the book of Acts and even in some of the other letters which shows that in order for us to spend forever with Jesus we have to enter into covenant and that's how we enter into covenant and we have to be mindful of one thing there may be some of you out there who may have just come to the Lord and and you may have received the measure of the Spirit of God and you you're not a part of a church right now but your desire is to be a part of church and to get baptized and I would encourage you to do that to become a part of a local body and to seek the Lord but if your mentality is to say well I don't have to be baptized mm -hmm. to be saved or to know the Lord then essentially not only are you cutting yourself off from God you have no right to speak on behalf of God and there are other areas of your life in which you are in error there are other areas of the Word of God that you are also disobeying so it isn't just mm -hmm. that one area it's mm -hmm. we're talking about the mentality here right. where it says well I don't have to do that or I don't have to do this mm -hmm. and God has to deliver you from that form of rebellion mm -hmm. that you are operating in or else you can't serve God so right. and, and, and God works through his church and right. unless we are baptized into Christ we are not a part of the church right right we have there are so many examples of uh, what we're talking about in reference to this unction this unction that God gives uh, through knowledge or, or through just this this yeah. spiritual impulse to to be in connection with God and when they hear of baptism when they hear of this this washing away the water represents something great in reference to the very blood of Jesus that washes our sins away and so when we are immersed in the water it describes something so profound and so for us to put it on the back burner it it, it really uh, shows the level of of ignorance that we can walk in um, and so the, uh, uh, what comes to mind is the eunuch the eunuch yeah. when he's um, he, he doesn't have um, knowledge of the scriptures he uh, Philip is uh, the, uh, the evangelist um, reveals to him you know the 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 word of God in reference to the expounding of the word of God and who that scripture was talking about which was Jesus Christ right and then he has this unction it, 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 it he says what must uh, what hinders me from being baptized there's water there's water what hinders me he didn't from have being to be, baptized? he didn't have to be forced he wanted to do right. it he wanted, he to, wanted do to do it, do it. Like, after hearing the gospel after hearing uh, the 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 type of redemption that that lies within the gospel he was empowered there's there's there is an empowering agent in the redemption story of the Lord Jesus Christ in what he does there is a a redemption aspect that completely transforms an individual and, and so of course we know the power of God is the reason for that so uh, another scripture that I wanted to turn to was in, in Acts. You mentioned the Acts earlier, and I was thinking on Acts earlier to go to, and I'm just going to go there. Acts chapter um, 19, verses 4, where um, it says, uh, actually verse 3, uh, this is Paul, um, and he said unto them, uh, unto what then were ye baptized? And they said unto John's baptism. Uh, then said Paul, um, then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, which is Jesus Christ. That is, and it says that is Christ, that is on Christ Jesus. Um, when they heard this, they were they they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus and when Paul had laid hands upon them the Holy Ghost came upon them and they spake with tongues and prophesied mm -hmm. that is powerful that is showing that God is who draws men unto repentance God opens the eyes of the blind God strengthens the hands of the feeble God makes uh, life where there was no life 
God strengthens and, and, and aids the individual to uh, have the, the renewed mind. The Bible talks about being renewed in the spirit of your mind. And so this is what the Lord Jesus is doing. He wants us to understand that baptism is not a, uh, a, a far left doctrine, not something that is something we can add maybe if we have an opportunity. This is essential uh, because it represents so much. It is so deep and immersed in what Jesus did. It means so much. So it cannot be something that we exclude. And also, too, there, there is the belief among people to say, well, this is not the unpardonable sin. So if, if I don't happen to get baptized, I mean, I know it's a sin, but it's not the unpardonable sin. But the reality is that type of mentality is somewhat unpardonable because again there are going to be other areas in which you are disobeying god so to say that well yes it is a sin but it's not the unpardonable sin it's not blasphemy of the holy spirit but it's the mentality of the same individuals who do blaspheme mm. the spirit of god that condemns them mm -hmm. so yes it is a sin not to be baptized and it just shows that you that that whoever is not willing to commit their lives to jesus christ fundamentally or or how would you say um in a very very simple manner yeah. is yeah. denying the lord and, right. and and you're essentially that mentality is what drives people to hell right right it sure does we we don't realize that um that there are lifestyles there are conditions of mind that ultimately steer a person's actions and leads them to a place that they don't want to go you know and so we and so that's it's it's good that i just ended on that because we should transition to the topic of hell you know hell is a real place hell is uh, something that was not made for mankind it was not made for mankind but we do know that god allows man to go there and the reason why is because mankind has an option a solution to not walk in the spirit of the fallen angels but mankind through disobedience through rebellion through hypocrisy through carnality through all manner of evil operate in that same spirit and then become candidates for hell and so hell is a spiritual place not a place that you can go to naturally it's a spiritual dimension that ultimately is in the center of the earth that uh, mankind uh, ultimately goes to uh, as god uh, permits them to you know God it, it's a place of eternal torment uh, it's a, a place of eternal punishment um, it's a place to where there are that there, there is everything that is not good uh, uh, some people may say you know uh, there's certain parts of the earth that are hell you know they, they may say Oh, um, I'm, I'm living in hell. You know, my my my, my um, car payment is hell. Uh, my my mortgage is hell. My uh, my relationship with my baby mama is hell. You know, they, they may say all manner of things like my, uh, my this, my that is hell. No, there is nothing worse than hell in reference to what it truly is because hell is the absence of all that is good hell is the absence of love in the sense that there is the absence of the the good things about love there's the absence of uh, of like uh, kindness there's the absence of all of the things that we kind of take for granted there's absence of all of the elements of of the earth that are that are uh, a non uh, that, that absence of the things that are are good that there, there are only things that destroy there 
they're, they're only the destructive things in hell. And you have uh, ultimately angels, these fallen angels uh, or, or angels that God have uh, has uh, enlisted or, or uh, um, uh, put in charge of the, these different uh, chambers in hell. And so we, we know that Jesus talks about hell throughout the scriptures. It's, and so we have uh, many people that have uh, doctrines that talk about hell is fiction. Hell is not real. Hell is the, um, you know, the, the overemphasis of specific words in the Bible. And it's just the, the imagination of men. Um, it's not a literal place uh, in, in, in their minds. And so I remember a, qu a quick testimony. I remember there was a, a man who was, I believe, a believer in the Lord Christ Jesus. And, and he, he was, um, uh, in fellowship, you know, but, uh, there was a, a, there was, there was a time where he gave me a theological, a, a, how can I say it? it was like some sort of theological book um, that I never read. I, I, somehow it made it in my attic and, and I never read it, um, um, you know, because I, I don't really believe in uh, seminary schools uh, uh, or cemetery schools. <laughs> I don't believe in them to the degree that uh, because of the fact that they Many of them are not led by spirit led people, people who are born again, people can be who who are clearly born again. Now, I'm not saying every single one of them are, are bad. I'm not saying that there is no such thing as a born again believer in a seminary, uh, because, of course, that would be error if I would say that. Uh, but I'm saying for the, because of the majority of what we see, because of what comes out of these seminaries, because of the teachings that we see in masses um, of, of, of different elements of error, um, different er elements of, of corrupt teaching um, as far as Bible teaching by these people in these offices, it just reflects that the, the, the school structure system is is something that has strayed away from the spirit of God and has entered into all manner of uh, darkness. So uh, continue with the story as uh, so one day I, I I'm, I'm, I'm doing some cleaning and I actually go in my attic and I have um, a, a topic in mind and and I was actually teaching on hell it was the last time I taught on hell which is maybe like a year and a half ago and I'm I'm looking up the definition of hell in this book I just wanted to see I guess I was a little curious I just wanted to see what their definition of hell was and when I read it I had to read it um, numerous times because I couldn't believe my eyes it was basically saying that hell was not real that it was a fictional place and it was saying some other things and it was saying that and it was trying to justify it by saying that oh there is th that uh, bec because there is no um as far as our senses it was justifying it even further after its supposed statements it was trying to justify it by talking about we we the senses we don't um, taste it, touch it, feel it. Uh, we, we, it. It was describing a spiritual place with the senses. It's, it's, it's kind of like trying to describe God and, and trying to justify God's existence, you know, with the, the senses, as if we yeah. don't know that the senses are limited. They're, 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 we're talking about spiritual um, discernment and understanding. And so this book, I, I read it and I see that it's talking about hell in this way. And then I um, write blaspheme in it. And then I uh, write um, hell is real. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Something like that. And I throw the book away and I hope somebody finds it and reads it. Uh, uh, in reference to my note, not the book. <laughs> and so, um, but ultimately it goes to show me. Like, this is not just one person's book. This is a, a book that's mass produced. 
Yeah. This is not just one. So when I talk about the the, the cemetery schools, the seminary schools, th- th- this is not one person's belief. This is a mass, a multitude of people who believe that there are evangelical Christians that believe in this this doctrine that's within the book. And so this is the corruption that is 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 flowing through yeah. the Christian body. And it's really an oxymoron at the end of the day cuz what are what, what what's so good about the gospel? What's why the good news if if there is no hell? What's so good about it? I mean, if none of us are going to be punished for our actions, you know, then why the good news? Why having Jesus have to die for our sins and rise again if there is no place of punishment? Hmm. If he took on punishment, he took on the full wrath of God. It's The Word of God specifically says that in Psalm 22, it talks about, Father, why have you forsaken me? Obviously, the Father was with him, but what he was essentially saying is that he was taking on the, the punishment of man sent all upon himself, so it felt like he was forsaken. Mm. He was experiencing the wrath of God um, upon himself. He was saying he was bearing the sins of the entire world. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and essentially put, um, the reason why people believe this stuff is because there is no fear of God before their eyes. That's just simply the truth. Yeah. And I have Psalm 36 here, verse 1 and 2. David says, The transgression of the wicked says within my heart that there is no fear of God before his eyes for he flatters himself in his own eyes until his iniquity be found to be hateful so essentially um the reason why people don't believe in hell um obviously is because they don't know the lord that's just one obvious reason um and we have to be mindful of that um now it's it's, now if it was outside of the church then the people don't believe in god anyway but the fact that this is going on in the church as brother ron mentioned as as far as evangelicals um pastors, um, different men and women of God who are reading different books or who are coming to the conclusion that hell does not exist. The Jehovah's Witnesses believe this. Mm -hmm. The Seventh-day Adventists believe this. Mm -hmm. And there are other so-called professed Christian cults out there that don't believe this. When essentially Jesus said many times in the scriptures that people are going to go there if they reject him. Mm -hmm. So our refusal to acknowledge what God has said has left us to it really has taken away any discernment that we may have had to begin with mm-hmm. has been completely taken from us. And, and the, what, 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 what's being taught then is, is that I can have Jesus. I can have the good news. I can have the gospel. I can believe in Jesus. I can follow him, but yet not turn from sin. Because if there's no punishment for my sin, if I if I'm not if we're not awaiting a devil's hell and condemnation to be cast eventually away from God forever for our sins, if we're not being taught the severity of God, Paul says that right. in Romans 11, right. knowing the goodness, goodness and, and the severity, severity of God, he talked about how Israel, God's own people, were cast into the nations because they rebelled against Him. And, and he talks about the goodness and severity of God. Goodness as in why God shows his mercy, his grace and love, and his forgiveness to those whom he wants to come close to him, those whom he wants to follow him, and then the severity of God of what he does to those who do not commit, who do not obey. And we see examples of that in the scriptures. Jesus in the, in, in, in the New Testament talks about a place where there is, the, the worm does not die, the mm-hmm. fire is not quenched, and there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. He's not speaking in a fable, in a, in a story-like way here. He's saying this is reality. There are people who he spoke that to in his day that are there now. Mm-hmm. There, there are people who have been there from the very beginning. And, 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 and the prophet Isaiah lets us know that when the devil himself is cast into hell, it says the kings of the earth, those who have, who were once kings, who once re- were reigning on the earth, they are already there, and they're they're seeing the devil coming, they're seeing Satan coming, and they're saying to him, "Are you have become weak as we? You know, hmm. you who did destroy the nations hmm. in anger, you've become as weak as we are." And then it, let's not let's not mention the fact that at the end of the book of Revelation, when Jesus returns, he cast the beast and the false prophet into right. the lake of fire. And right. then a thousand years later, the devil's going to join them. Right. 
So we have to be very serious. And essentially what we're saying is when people don't believe that there is a hell, they must also conclude that the God that they say that they believe in does not exist. They have to. They have to. Because we're... We're, we're talking about, you know, because when people say, you know, they, 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 they say they don't believe in the devil. They say they don't believe that um, hell exists. Uh, they throw it all out. You know, you have uh, big name preachers, teachers that are propagating this, that are pushing this message. And many people are biting it, eating it, hook, lying in sinker. They're, they're, because... Um, even as we talked about in the last video, we talked about doctrines of comfort, you know, doctrines of disappointment ultimately was the title of it. But we're talking about these doctrines of comfort. They comfort people in their sin and they never liberate people um, in the true understanding that really brings comfort and liberty. True liberty, like, you know, the Bible tells us that where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. So the spirit of God comes to open us up to his real truth. And and he and he and, and even though the real truth may be somewhat terrifying or scary in a sense, he tells us not to be afraid. He tells us that he has overcome the world. He tells us, hey, obey me, obey the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. You, 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 you know, you won't have to endure what the rebellious will have to endure. You won't have to endure what the, the, the corrupt, what the blasphemers ha will have to endure. You will, uh, you, you will endure to the end. So there is an importance in true revelation of what Jesus is saying and grabbing a hold of that and hanging on to that until he comes. Yeah. So one of the scriptures that I wanted to bring out was in um, 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 11. It says, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, mm -hmm. we persuade men. But we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. And so what we're talking about here is, it says, knowing the terror of the Lord. What is the terror of the Lord? Why would there be a terror of the Lord if there was no hell? The terror of the Lord is understanding the price for rebelling against the God yep. of all creation. God is ultimately a gentleman and he's not going to force us into rebelling against him. But if we choose that route, we ultimately are going to be candidates, as I was saying earlier, for hell. And so we, we don't want to just erase the topic of hell or erase the concepts or the doctrine of hell in some false pretense or this false idea that it's not going to exist anymore yeah. because we don't believe in it or because we just um, in some psychological way have discarded it. Yeah. Hell is still hot and is still a reality. It's still tormenting. It's 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 enlarging itself as the Bible talks about. And so the 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 reality is that we know the terror of God. We know the severity of God. And we know that if we don't uh, walk in the level of repentance and change that God is requiring by his grace, we are ultimately going to find ourselves um, looking up as it talks about in, I believe, Luke 16, you know, um, uh, it, 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 even though that was a, a version of hell at that point, uh, because we know that 
in the before Jesus died, before Jesus died, there was something that was called paradise. There was something that was called Abraham's bosom. And as uh, so everyone that was in Abraham's bosom at that time uh, was those that ultimately walked in a measure of righteousness on the earth prior to the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and there was a hell part where those who did evil yeah. um, prior to the, the, <clears throat> the death, burial, and resurrection of Lord Jesus Christ, all those who did evil was on one side of this uh, large uh, cavern or this large separation. And th there was others who were on the, on the paradise side, on the Abraham's bosom side. And when Jesus, as Peter talks about, goes into the earth and preaches to these souls, preaches to these spirits, he ultimately pays for their entrance into heaven. The Bible talks about in Ephesians that he led captivity captive. He led these captives in paradise to heaven because no man ultimately, no spirit ultimately that died on earth was able to enter heaven before Jesus escorted him or her into heaven, um, you know, as that atoning factor, because the law was the reason why they could not, because the law was not perfect, as the word of God t tells us. The law could not atone for them on that level to the point where they could enter into heaven after faithfully living out a life under the law. They needed what Jesus Christ was able to do for them, which was the this this purifying blood, this purifying redemption that came through him to ultimately give them access to heavenly places where the Father um, sits. And ultimately the Lord defines what death really is because he says for the wages of sin is death. Now, as Paul mentioned in 2 Timothy 4, how people will turn to fables. They right. will heed to themselves teachers having itching ears. Right. So these same individuals, um, whether in the church or outside of the church, um, are going to be preaching on many different things. If, if you believe them, it's going to send you to hell. And, and this is one of those primary teachings um, and doctrines of devils is to say that hell does not exist. Right. That a, that a, a holy God does not send people to hell. He, he's, he does it every single day. Right. And, and, and it just goes to show us, the, again, the goodness and severity of God. If God is holy and he is just and he has to punish sin, it's not, an, it's not just enough for him to just, when somebody dies, he ceases to exist. Mm -hmm. It's not going to happen with God. Um, there is, there is a, satisf not a, not a satisfaction, but rather the fulfilling of his wrath that shows us that because it's eternal, because it has to be an eternal punishment, it has to be in a eternal torment, this will justify God's decision on his behalf to, to have come and saved man to begin with. Mm -hmm. He has to give ma man a, a way out a way of salvation through the person of Jesus Christ so we can escape that place. Now, we don't just come to Jesus Christ to escape, to escape hell. We come to Jesus Christ because we ought to be like him in the first place. Amen. So our refusal to acknowledge that um, is essentially going to, we're going to lack the fear of God. And we have to understand that it is not God's will for us to go there. But Essentially, too, what we're talking about is the heart of man. Mm -hmm. It's essentially the heart of man that allows these spirits and, and, and these doctrines to arise in the first place. Mm -hmm. We want to preach on the things of God. We want to speak on God's behalf. And we want to believe whatever we want. But unless we stop being bad people, mm -hmm. we stop lying, we stop stealing, we stop doing things that God doesn't want us to do, these doctrines are in place for us to believe them if we are not going to obey God. So any doctrine really, whether it's the reason why you don't want to get baptized, 
The reason why you want to believe in the law of Moses, even mm -hmm. though Jesus abolished it, mm -hmm. you want to not believe in hell. You don't believe that you have to give all to God. You don't believe mm -hmm. that you have to go to church with the body of Christ. The reason why you believe these things is because you're a bad person. Mm -hmm. And unless you are truly converted and stop sinning mm -hmm. and let God change your heart, mm -hmm. these doctrines are in place for you to believe. So that way, God, as he told the prophet Malachi, mm -hmm. that you'll, in the end, will be able to distinguish and to discern between the righteous and the wicked, between those who actually serve God and those who don't serve him. So it should be, um, as far as those of us who are living for God now, it should come to no surprise as to why the majority choose to believe mm -hmm. these erroneous doctrines right. because it just goes to show you that the scriptures must be fulfilled. Many are departing away from the truth, and the reason why they're departing from the truth is because they don't have a heart for it. Right, right, right. And so it is very vital that we understand that hell is real and the terror of the Lord uh, is something that God wants us to understand we can not be a part of in reference to us being saved through the sanctifying blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so God is calling you today to to repent, to turn from the lifestyle of darkness. You know, some people may do good deeds, but that is not enough. God uh, wants us to know that your deeds aren't considered good until you have given God your life. You are not an owner of your life. You are a manager of your life and the owner the true owner of your life is going to want you to give an account for what you've done with the life that he's given you the bible tells us in hebrews chapter 9 verses 27 i believe it tells us that it is appointed unto every man once to die and after this is the judgment and that judgment ultimately is the standing before the Lord Jesus Christ and declaring to him what you have done with the gift of life that he has given you on earth. And so it is vital that we have the testimony of Jesus in us, illuminating from us so that we can truly know that when we stand before Jesus Christ, that it is going to be a good answer that we received. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Enter into his joy. He'll say, my joy. Enter into that because you are of me. You look like me spiritually. And now this is your inheritance forever. And so God loves people. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, and that whosoever would believe on that son of God, Jesus Christ, would not perish, but have everlasting life. And God loves people. He gives people space to repent. He gives people time to turn to him. He works in us. He works around us. And he wants for you to know that it's not too late for you to turn to him. But you must do it quickly before the setting of, of hardness and stoniness manifest in your heart and soul. Uh, there's a window to repent. There's a window to turn to him. If you feel by the grace of God right now that God is tugging at your heart, wanting you to truly commit to him, you knowing that you've been living a life running from him, living a life estranged from God. Come to the Lord Jesus now. He loves you. His, his power is available to transform you. There is no sin that you've done that is beyond his ability to redeem and repair. He wants you to know that he is love and he is eternal life. He is giving mankind something mankind has never heard of eternal living 
eternal living was given by no religious leader no person has offered mankind eternal living eternal life he gives you the opportunity to live eternally beyond the temporary life that you are experiencing on this planet he gives you an opportunity to be with him living forever even if you don't understand that right now it's okay he wants you to know that that is a reality that can happen and that is going to happen it's prophesied it is happening right now there are entities that have that that live eternally that don't have a measure of life or a timeline or a slot of life eternal life can be yours and jesus wants you to be a part of what he's doing on the earth and what he will ultimately do and accomplish in life eternal. God loves you. We love you. And we want you to turn from sin to the hope that God has placed in all of those that believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Brother Will, you want to say anything as far as closing in reference to God's love for people, God's desire for the transformation of the heart? Yes, one last thing. Um, the church um, is the pillar of the living God, and, and the church is the most important place on the planet. And it's, it's in the body of Christ where the Lord dwells. And if we, are, if we have removed ourselves outside of that, we are already walking in error. We are already, um, well, essentially, you would be on your way to hell if you remove yourself away from the covering that God has set. And um, in order for us to grow in God, if we are to commit our lives with him, we have to submit ourselves to God and to those whom he has placed in our lives, um, the church of the living God, body of true believers, and um, a people who fear God and want to serve him. And as Brother Ron was stating, as far as um, John chapter 3, verse 16, um, we have to be mindful that God does bless the obedience those who obey but and he curses those who disobey and he makes it very clear that those who live for him faithfully will have everlasting life but those who do not do that and and, and don't walk after god will experience everlasting um I, I think daniel says it everlasting contempt and everlasting damnation mm -hmm. so either we are going to heaven or we are going to hell when we die and as far as we're concerned the lord is giving us the opportunity to spend forever with him and there are standards that he has set that we have to meet and refuse to meet those standards then we will not be able to spend forever with him if we meet those standards by faith we will spend forever with him but our hearts have to be in agreement with him right right so by faith faith that strengthens us in grace towards the fulfillment of the true identity on our lives so god bless each and every one of you that are that have joined us this night by the grace of god we love each and every one of you and um brother will and i uh by the grace of god we'll see you soon see you again in jesus name and as i always say feet follows focus so focus on lord jesus christ and your feet my feet our feet will follow in jesus name god bless you Walk by faith and not by sight.